वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम शोभिक मुखोपाध्याय एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कलकत्ता एंड टुडे अंडर द पेपर सोशल एंड कल्चरल हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडिया फ्रॉम द अर्लीएस्ट टू 1707 वी विल बी डीलिंग डिस्कसिंग अबाउट अ मॉड्यूल दैट इज सोशल हिस्ट्री ऑफ डेकान सिरका ट्वेल्व टू फिफ्टीन the main objective of this lesson is to look into the dynamics of social change in dekan uh, which begins with the onset of sultanate rule and the subsequent bahmani and the vijayanagara empires to begin with we will be focusing on the concept of dekan dekan unlike other coherent core regions like north india bengal or tamil country is underrepresented in the social sciences despite sporadic periods of imperial rule of the uh, chalukyas both western and the kalyani rashtrakutas bahmanis and the subsequent vijayanagara empire the region did not have enduring political and cultural centers and hence the region was underrepresented in historical literature Farishta a noted historian during the sultanate period mapped the region on the basis of vernacular languages prevalent there he wrote one of the four sons of india that is hind was dakkan who in turn had three sons marhat kanhar and tiling so dekan as indeed for the period between 1300 and 1600 centuries consisted of regions comprising of the speakers of marathi kannada and telugu languages if this is the condition of dekan then we move on to the dekan society prior to the delhi sultanate invasions because without the prior background we don't understand or we fail to understand what was actually the impact of the deccan sultanate invasions deccan society prior to the delhi sultanate invasions uh, saw profound social changes taking place in deccan prior to the entry of delhi sultanate army in the first place the interior of the plateau was settled by pioneering cultivators who between 12th and early 14th century displaced and incorporated the indigenous pastoral groups cynthia talbert in her relatively recent study on the andhra region casts considerable light on how andhra region emerged as distinct sub region during the kakatiya rule however comparable research on the two other sub regions that is karnataka and maharashtra compared to cynthia talbert's study has yet to be undertaken this period prior to the deccan uh, invasion of the deccan sultanate saw emergence of regional languages as early as 1053 the term andhra bhasha language of andhra was being used to denote telugu similarly a marathi religious text in the 13th century also enjoined its followers to stay in maharashtra and not to go to the neighboring telugu or kannada countries in this manner one can visualize how linguistic distinction was helping in the growth of subregional identity this period along with the emergence of regional languages also saw emergence of a distinct warrior class a uh, stratum of the warrior based elite this process was galvanized by different warrior groups who had formed states in different parts of dekan semi arid interior in the 12th and 13th centuries these 
ruling class, they started patronizing vernaculars as opposed to pan-Indian prestigious Sanskrit language. Under the Kakatiyas, the Telugu speakers of the rich and densely settled littoral region between Krishna and Godavari Delta region was politically integrated with the interior of Telangana. Similarly, the Yadavas consolidated their rule over Maharashtra with predominantly Marathi speaking people while the Hoysalas were doing the same among the Kannada speaking people in Karnataka. These groups, uh, not only there was emergence of a distinct warrior class, but the social process was extended farther by utilizing the undulating topography, the Kakatiyas and their subordinates had constructed nearly around 5000 tanks in the Telangana region which opened up a relatively unproductive region to both dry and wet cultivation. Thus, newly constructed tanks formed the basis of a new economy. The region, earlier known for its pastoral activity, was thus assimilated when the former herders or shifting cultivators were integrated into a predominantly agrarian society. For the first time, the political centers in these three regions uh, with Warangal in Telangana, Dwarasamudra in Karnataka and Devagiri in Maharashtra were situated in agricultural backwaters unlike in the olden times when the political capital was situated in the riverine delta region like Tanjavur in the Kaveri region. This is a sure sign of a dynamic process with the agricultural frontier on the move. Here, the role of the temples are very important. This dynamic was reflected uh, in the different kind of temples being patronized by the Kakatiyas or the Hoysalas. Apart from large and venerable temples dotting the coastal region, those predating the Kakatiya period, now more numerous smaller temples were appearing mainly in Dekan's dry interior, datable only to the Kakatiya period. Similarly, one can talk about the Hoysalas as well. These temples played a crucial role in expanding the agricultural frontier as their endowments included building and maintenance of tanks. These temples were primarily funded not by the dynastic chiefs, the big dynasties like the Hoysalas, Kakatiyas or the Yalavas, but subordinate chiefs and military leaders who consolidated their control by patronizing these religious institutions. Apart from the expansion of the agricultural frontier, in the social sphere, we find that a kind of egalitarian social ethos prevailed. These frontier regions showed a relatively egalitarian social ethos, particularly in the Kakatiya ruled Andhra. The Kakatiya kings, barring one exception, embraced Sudra status. The warrior groups in Andhra proudly proclaimed their Sudra origin, particularly during the reign of the last two Kakatiya rulers, Rudrama Devi and Prataparudra Deva, the entrenched power of the hereditary nobles were challenged by the rising prominence of the officers of humble origin, of the Shudra origin. This was the social condition prevailing in Deccan prior to the uh, invasion led by the Deccan Sultanate army. What happened after the invasion took place? normal pace of the social and political transformation in Deccan, which we have just outlined, was mutated because of the intervention of the uh, from northern India based Deccan Sultanate. For the first time, Deccan was invaded by the Sultanate army during the reign of Alauddin Khalji in 1309. The stable 
regional kingdoms whose boundaries coincided with the vernacular linguistic regions like the Kakatiyas, Hoysalas or the Yadavas were challenged and finally supplanted by the Delhi Sultanate which was of trans-regional character both politically and culturally. The political power in the uh, Delhi Sultanate was generated by highly mobile units of mounted archers. Under this condition, the initial impact of Delhi Sultanate was largely destructive on Deccan. However, once the authority of Deccan, Delhi Sultanate was consolidated, the new rulers moved on to patronize indigenous institutions to stabilize the new order. With the inroads of Delhi Sultanate and the transfer, so-called transfer of capital, which was actually a co-capital in Delhi Sultanate during the time of uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, when Dalatabad was adopted as the co-capital, large number of Muslim population, they migrated to Deccan, particularly in the northwestern part of Deccan. Uh, during the time of the transfer of capital ordered by Muhammad bin Tughlaq, one-tenth of Delhi population migrated to south. This led into the formation of a true colony in northwestern Deccan. Along with the initial colonists, there arrived Sufi saints, primarily of Chishtia extraction, but later of other persuasions as well. These Sufi saints provided another new element in the making of a new Deccan society. Delhi Sultanate, after its initial inroads and establishment of its authority and control, withdrew as early as between 1339 and 1347 when two families operating on opposite sides of the Krishna river led movements which ended the rule of the Delhi Sultanate. Even while supplanting the rule of Delhi Sultanate, these two dynasties, they appropriated the conceptual basis of the authority as enunciated in Delhi Sultanate. The rulers of both the dynasties, Bahumani and Vijayanagara, they adopted the title Sultan, interestingly. Though the memory of regional kingdoms like the Yadavas and the Hoysalas were alive, but the new states, Bahamani and Vijayanagara, became regional successors of the Sultanate authority. After the removal of Delhi Sultanate, uh, the Deccan, Northern Deccan, was manned by, ruled by Bahamani Sultanate and the southern part of Deccan, uh, there emerged the Vijayanagara kingdom. In the Bahamani Sultanate, the region ruled by the Bahamani Sultanate, the society, it evolved in a particular manner. And now we will be talking about the social uh, conditions in the Bahamani Sultanate. Bahamani Sultanate drew its authority, among many other things, from the Barkat, of the Sufi saints, particularly of the Chishti order. Nizamuddin Auliya's leading disciple, Burhan al-Din Gharib, had joined the throng of the northerners who migrated to Dalatabad. When Burhan died in 1337, the protective presence, that is Barkat, passed on to his own leading disciple, Sheikh Zain al-Din Shirazi. It was through Sheikh's indirect agency that Bahamani Sultanate got transformed from a rebel movement into a legitimate Indo-Islamic kingdom. When Taimur Lang attacked Delhi, another venerable Sufi saint, the descendant or the leader of the Chishti uh, order, uh, Saint Gesudaraz, left Delhi and came to Deccan. He came to be one of the most venerated 
Sufi saint in the region. And shortly after his death in 1422, his gravesite became the most popular Muslim shrine in Deccan then, which is still now. Now, the arrival of the North Indian Sufis in Deccan during the 14th and 15th century wrought deep changes in the region's political and religious fabric. First of all, they provided the moral authority to the successor state. As a result, the Bahamanis, which the earlier uh, Khalji and the Tughlaq invaders lacked legitimacy, they gained legitimacy from allegiance with those Sufi saints. The Sufi saints, uh, by giving them a kind of legitimacy, made the Bahamani rule uh, very in thing in the Deccan society. The presence of the Sufi saints also led into the uh, conversion of uh, many of the local population and thus uh, uh, the Muslim population they started increasing in Deccan, uh, in Deccan, particularly in north of western part of Deccan. And in this manner, politics and society both were influenced by the coming in of the uh, Sufi saints. In the language of classical Islam, the presence and blessings of the great Sufi sheikhs transformed Darul Harb, that is, abode of war or strife, into Darul Islam, abode of peace, thereby bringing in coherence, transplanting legitimate Indo Muslim rule and civilization from region to region within South Asia. So, here we have how uh, the notion that with the coming in of the Sufi saints, this resulted in a change in the religious atmosphere, condition and the presence of the uh, Islamic institutions, mosques and the Muslim population, it increased. On the other hand, uh, we find another very important change taking place at least in the upper echelons of the society. The Bahamani Sultans, because of several factors, aggressively attracted Iranian and Persian men of talent in their courts. First of all, the Bahamani uh, kingdom, uh, within 200 years of its rule, they have witnessed somewhere around 14 uh, kings or rulers and many of them, they were killed or assassinated within a very short time. This was because of uh, intense rivalry, factional fighting within oneself. One, this is one and another was the uh, coming and the overbearing presence of Taimur Lang and his making of Samarkand as the not only political but cultural capital of the Muslim West. Emulating Taimur Lang's example became a uh, very uh, in thing, very, very attractive to all the Muslim rulers in that period of time. And under the influence of such factors, we find that the Bahamani Sultans were aggressively attracting the Iranian and the Persianized men of talent in their courts. This became particularly prominent from the times of Feroz and his brother Ahmad I's reign between 1397 and 1436. These people of Iranian and Persian extraction, speaking Persian language, came to be known in the contemporary sources as Gharbiyam, which means Westerners. And these Persian immigrants were given top positions in the Bahamani uh, political apparatus. People like Mahmud Gawan, who personally came to the port of Dabhol as a merchant. He had an appellation Malik al Tujjar. Tujjar means merchant, which clearly shows that he was of a merchant extraction. Basically, he has come for uh, selling uh, good 
horses to the Bahamani Sultan. He and many of uh, many people like him rose to the top eclairons of the political elite. Mahmud Gawan, as the Prime Minister in the Bahamani Sultanate, wrote many letters to uh, the Western rulers as well as the intellectuals in the uh, Muslim West. The extant letters written by Gawan shows that he was in continuous touch with the rulers and the intellectuals of Central Asia, trying to entice particularly the latter in migrating to the Bahamani court. In this manner, many people were coming from the Muslim West and the merchants, scholars, administrators or sometimes soldiers hailing from the Persian speaking world, they were enjoying a favored status in the court, intermarrying within this group of the Westerners and thus they were emerging as a block politically and socially as well obviously uh, culturally distinct from the local elite known as the Deccanis and this emergence of the Westerners and the Deccanis, this ultimately resulted in a kind of elite conflict in a plural society. Who were the Deccanis? The category of the Deccanis was similarly both political and cultural category, generally referring to families who had migrated to the Aulatabad in 1327 when Muhammad bin Taklak declared it as the new co-capital. These original colonists first threw away their allegiance to the Delhi Sultanate and then they started sinking roots in the local society, getting acquainted with acquiring the proficiency in the local languages like the Marathi, Kannada and Telugu languages and in the process they evolved their own vernacular that is Dakani or Dekani Urdu. As a result of these two distinct groups, the Westerners and the Dekanis, it resulted in conflict. Notwithstanding the cultural enrichment because of the inclusion of Western elements, it ultimately led into the increasing alienation of that section of the indigenous nobility categorized as Deccanis and ultimately the polarization led into internal violence so much so that Mahmud Gawan at a point of time was assassinated and that kind of conflict between the Westerners and the Deccanis became a very very uh, common feature of the Bahamani Sultanate led into the destruction of the Bahamani Sultanate and the growth of the successor, five successor Sultanates in the upper part of Deccan. Not only the Western and the Deccani elements, another new element also came into the uh, Northern Deccan though its influence was not that uh, very enduring like the other two factors that we have talked about. That is the coming of Abyssinian military slaves who were known as the Habsis. In the later period, the offshoots of the Bahamani Sultanate, for instance Ahmadnagar, brought yet another stream of migrants, the Habsis or the Abyssinian slaves from Ethiopia. The meteoric rise of Malik Ambar during the time of the Mughal um, Emperor Jahangir in the 17th century in Ahmadnagar Sultanate epitomizes such migration and the impact of the such migration in the uh, political scenario which also had some kind of influence in the social sphere as well. Socially however, the effect of such migration was transient in its nature. Few Ethiopian females were ever brought as slaves to Deccan. As a result, the Habsi men necessarily married local women as did their male offsprings and this manner 
unlike in americas these hapsies could not produce self reproducing enduring black population in deccan male hapsies and other africans soon became mainly absorbed in the local society when this was happening in the northern part of deccan what was the situation in the southern part of deccan which was uh, ruled by vijayanagara we want to look into the social scape of vijayanagara vijayanagara is represented in historical literature borrowing uh, from sevel's idea that it was a kind of hindu bulwark against the mohammedan conquests vijayanagara was the last bastion of hindu resistance to the muslim inroads this is the uh, general perception which prevailed in the earlier historical research however we find that vijayanagara kings were adopting the epithet hindu raya suratrana that is the sultan among the hindu kings which itself shows that the vijayanagara kings despite their fight with the bahmani sultanate they were adopting a kind of persianized uh, culture not only that not only the courtly culture but during the time of devaraya the second he recruited somewhere around 10000 turk cavalry and constructed mosque within vijayanagara for their service so uh here we find that both in bahmani and the vijayanagara empire a kind of persianized culture started prevailing despite the local or their specific kind of uh, religious or social ethos generalized uh, we can say that a kind of persianized uh, culture a uh, kind of heritage drawn from the delhi sultanate prevailed in the deccan particularly in the court culture from the level of uh, the um, high politics if we move into the popular level we find another kind of social change that can be discernible here we will be focusing mainly on the religious developments after gyanadev there was succession of poets in maharashtra who wrote in praise of vithova or vithala whose main shrine stands in pandharpur situated in southern maharashtra ever since the time of namadev who is thought to have inaugurated the tradition where men and women known as the varkaris were making pilgrimage to the famous temple of pandharpur and along way they were singing fervently the songs of their beloved saint poets this was the manner in which the uh, vithala cult was growing up the salient feature of this tradition was it was predominantly non brahmin and at times it was anti brahmin as well for instance the experiences of chokka mela the uh, untouchable mahar epitomizes such phenomena of anti brahminic or non brahminic element in the vithala cult vithova along with other deities like viroba maskoba or khandoba belonged to a long tradition of pastoral deities because in western part of deccan like eastern part of deccan as the pastoral activities was predominant in the earlier period there were lots of such pastoral deities being uh, being worshiped by the local population damodar dharmanand koshambi was the first historian who drew attention to the fact that was later reemphasized by another uh, very great scholar a german uh, gunther dietz santheimer santheimer had carefully studied the historical sociology of the desh country that is the uplands in maharashtra 
The earliest inhabitants in the region were tribals such as the Kolis, followed first by the Gauli pastoralists and then by the Dhangar pastoralists and finally by the Kunbi and the Maha, uh, Mali farmers. Pastoralists of the Desh have played an especially prominent role in shaping the Marathi society and culture. This can be gauged by the abundance of the hero stones raised in the memory of the fallen heroes who have laid down their lives in either protecting or retrieving or stealing of pastoral wealth, which is a typical phenomena in every pastoral society. Such kind of hero stones we find everywhere in the Deccan region. There was a very long time, almost for thousand years or even more, in which uh, this desh was transformed from a predominantly pastoral society into a predominantly agrarian economy, which we have earlier referred to while uh, we were talking about the Kakatiya uh, dynasty and its influence in transforming the pastoral uh, region into agricultural region, which was happening in the Deccan, uh, Western Deccan as well. And this was accompanied by the changing patterns of the religious uh, culture as well. The pastoral deities, originally represented by the unhewn stone, were slowly transformed into iconographic figures having distinct icons. This must possibly had happened from encounters between the pastoral and the agrarian societies. Similar transformation took place in case of Vitova as well. Originally emerging as pastoral deity, it underwent several transmutations, ultimately emerging as the original form of Vishnu. Thus, the colonization of the pastoral pastures by agrarian zones, which we have earlier seen in the context of the Kakatiya kingdom in Andhra, was taking place in Maharashtra along with the growth of Yadava state having wide-ranging ramifications in the religious as well as the social sphere. Because um, along with the emergence of these cults, with the growth of songs like Abhang uh, of Namdev or Tukaram, uh, regional languages were also developing. Recently, Sheldon Polak has raised the broader question of how and why the vernacular languages in India started acquiring literary status between 10th and 6th century. And in this context, he has emphasized on the role of the devotional religion as very important one. Here, in the uh, rise of the Vitova cult, the phenomena can be closely observed and analyzed in the context of Marathi language, which can again be uh, simulated in the case of the Kannada language or in the case of Telugu languages as well. So, the devotional literature churned out from Namadev to Tukaram in the form of Abhang a kind of devotional song prevalent in Maharashtra region, had tremendous influence on the emergence of Marathi as literary vernacular languages. In this manner, we find that between, say, 1300 and 1500, Deccan, both the Western Deccan and the Eastern Deccan, saw emergence of regional languages first, on the basis of the regional linguistic identity, regional kingdoms were emerging and suddenly there was the invasion of Delhi Sultanate which was a trans-regional kingdom and with the establishment of the successor states in the form of Bahamani and Vijayanagara kingdom, the social process which transmuted because of the a sudden invasion of Delhi Sultanate uh, started uh, developing in a different manner with the coming of the migrants from northern India, the Muslim settlers establishing themselves in the northwestern part of Deccan with the uh, advent of the Sufi saints, with the advent of the 
western elements persianized nobility from iran and other parts uh, the muslim west the uh, conflict between the Deccani element and the western element in uh, the southern part of uh, Deccan in the Vijayanagara empire, uh, Persianized court culture, emergence of popular religion, all these resulted, mixture of all these elements in a huge cauldron resulted in a distinct uh, formation of Deccan as a distinct region which is yet to be uh, fully focused in historical literature. For further information, please visit the EPG Parshala website and there you will be finding the um, other uh, study material as well. Thank you.